الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل على محمد الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربة The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. Imam Hassan al-Askari, Salawatullah wa Salaamuhu Alaih. Was born in the year 232 after Hijrah and died in the year 260 after Hijrah at the age of 28. A man from whose life many a lesson may be learned and indeed many an example may be derived. And a man whose life affects each and every one of our lives today. For he is known as being the father of the final of the Imams of Al Muhammad, Imam Al Mahdi, Salawatullah wa Salamuhu Unfortunately, Imam Al Askari's life has not been examined in the way that it should be. There are many who know very little about the life of Imam Al Askari, and many who do not know about the political circumstances that surrounded the life of this great personality. It is unfortunate to see that there are not enough detailed commentaries on his life or indeed analyzed biographies about what he faced. And indeed he faced hardship more than any of the Imams of Al Muhammad and the fact that the Abbasids had now known that the time was coming near for the birth of the promised one from the line of Fatima. Therefore there is a need for us to dissect his life as well as open up in reading about his great companions, personalities such as Fadl ibn Shadan, and indeed personalities such as Abu al Adyan. When we look at the Imam, as we said, the Imam was born in the 232nd year after Hijrah. His mother's name was Hudaytha. In some narrations, she is known as Salil. And you find that in other narrations, she is known as Sosan. But what is clear was that his mother's origin was from the southern part of Egypt. And therefore you find again another of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt whose mother comes from an area in Africa. His mother was revered for being one of the most pious women who was alive at the time. And you find that the Imam was one of five children. The Imam had an elder brother by the name of Muhammad and himself, and a brother by the name of Hussein, and a brother by the name of Ja'far, and a sister by the name of Aliya or Aliya. Many times people when they name the name Aliya or Aliya, many times they name it because they think it sounds good. If you were to actually ask them, who are you naming it after? They're like, you know what, the flow seems nice. No, 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 no. It's the 
sister of Imam al-Askari. That should be the intention when we name names. You find that Imam al-Askari amongst his brothers, you had two types. You had the very religious and the not so religious. And this highlights that even in the lives of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, in one family you may have a brother who's very religious and a brother who's not necessarily religious at all. Because Imam al-Askari's elder brother Muhammad was one of the most pious sons of any Imams of Al-Muhammad. That's why those of you who had the honor of visiting Samarra, on the way back you might have stopped at Balad. When you stopped at Balad, you went to Sayyid Muhammad, didn't you? Sayyid Muhammad is the brother of Imam al-Askari. He is buried not too far away from Samarra in the land of Balad. He was born three years before Imam al-Askari. Muhammad was born in the year 229 after Hijrah. And he died around the year 252 after Hijrah at the age of 23. And do you know this Muhammad, Imam al-Hadi used to love him very much. On the first level, Muhammad is the eldest son and this highlights that our belief in Imamat is not a belief in the eldest son. Otherwise, Muhammad, son of Imam al-Hadi, would have been the Imam. Muhammad, the son of Imam al-Hadi, was one of the most pious people. And the narration say to us, nobody was as respected, as honorable, or indeed as pious as Muhammad. And you found that there are different reasons as to his death. One narration mentioned that Imam al-Hadi had a piece of land in Balad. Muhammad went to collect the revenue of that land and he died there. Another narration says that no, he had a natural death in that land. You find that when Muhammad died, Imam al-Askari is narrated to have ripped his shirt open when he heard the news. Now this is something unusual for an Imam of Ahl al-Bayt. To show emotion like this is something very unusual. So they came to Imam al-Askari and they said, Imam, you are ma'soom, you are infallible. How are you one who rips your shirt upon hearing the news of the death of your elder brother? To which he replies, when Nabi Musa heard about the death of Harun, he did the same thing. Nabi Musa, when he heard the news about Harun's death, he also ripped his shirt. It's as if the chest gets enclosed. There is a lack of breath. You want to open your shirt. It's sad news. Muhammad, the son of Imam al-Hadi, I recommend you to perform his ziyarah. Why? Because amongst the gifts of Muhammad, the son of Imam al-Hadi, is that Allah answers the prayers under his dome. And especially the prayer of a family who cannot have children. If you go there, you'll see outside the haram, there is a cradle. The reason there's a cradle is many people who were not able to have kids went and visited and done the ziyarah of Muhammad, the son of Imam al-Hadi. And after they came back, Allah granted them their dua. Therefore, you found Muhammad, the son of Imam al-Hadi, the brother of Imam al-Askari, had died before Imam al-Askari. And you find Imam al-Askari also had a brother by the name of Ja'far. This Ja'far was not the most pious of men. On the contrary, there are ascriptions to Ja'far as being a known liar amongst other acts. And it shows you in one family, you may have a family with a fantastic name. But you find that amongst them, there may be people who are religious and there are people who are not so religious. The question arises, why is he known as Al-Askari? Now this is a very important issue, why? Because there are many who say, Assalamu alayka ya Imam Hassan Al-Askari. You say to him, why is he known as Al-Askari? They say, I have not got a clue. So you say, then what is the need of you respecting a man who you don't know the background of? Surely there has to be a background to the title. The reason he is called Al-Askari, Al-Askari refers to an army base. There are certain cities in Iraq who were originally army bases. They were not cities. They were army bases where if the army was driving or riding past an area, the army would stop there for a while and move on. For example, Kufa. Kufa was not a city. Kufa was an army base. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, when he took his army there in the 17th year after Hijrah, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas said this area looks like an area where people can live. 
So what happened was Kufa was not a city. Kufa became a city. After Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas decided people can live here. Originally Kufa was on the outskirts of an old Assyrian city by the name of Aluqa. Otherwise Kufa later on became a city. Likewise Imam where he resided was also originally an army base. Samarra was not a city. Samarra was an army base. And you found that why did it become an army base? Al Mu'tasim, the Khalifa, in his time, the Turks were more in control than the Abbasids. These Turks would ride their horses in Baghdad. When the Turks would ride their horses in Baghdad, sometimes what would they do? In the middle of the day, if a lady from Baghdad was walking, he'd come and the Turkish soldier would take her back. Or the Turkish soldier would harass her. The people of Baghdad spoke out. Al Mu'tasim, remember, was the Khalifa at the time of Imam al Jawad. The people of Baghdad spoke out. They came to Al Mu'tasim and they said to him that these Turkish soldiers come and harass us while we live in Baghdad. And we are ready to fight you and fight your soldiers. We do not care that you are Khalifa who lives in Baghdad. So he said, What will you fight me with? They said, Dua al Sahar. Notice, they didn't say with an army. They said, Dua al Sahar. We'll fight you with Dua al Sahar and we'll remove you. Mu'tasim decided, I need to leave Baghdad. I need to go and live somewhere else. On one of his journeys, he went to an area called Qatul. He felt it wasn't a good area to live. Then he went to Samarra. Samarra comes from the three words. It comes from the word Saramarra. Saramarra means what? Means that which is pleasing to the eye when someone looks at it. Those of you who have been to Samarra, have you seen how beautiful it is? On your way, you've got the Tigris River. You've got many forests and trees. It's a beautiful city. Mu'tasim went there and he decided that this Samarra should not be an army base. No, this Samarra will become a city. Originally, it was an askar or mu'askar. It was an area for an army. It wasn't an area to live in. He's the one who changed it to Samarra. And you find after him, Mutawakkil al-Abbasi had a famous incident in that area. From that time, they called it the area of Al-Askariyain. Imam Al-Hadi and Imam Al-Askari are called Al-Askariyain. The two who were there present in the Mu'askar or in the area of the army. I remember Al-Mutawakkil told all his soldiers, I want all of you to collect bags of wheat. Mutawakkil had over 100,000 soldiers. He said, all of you collect bags of wheat. And I want all of you to come to the area where I am building my army base and I want you to put all the bags together and I want you to make a hill for me which I can be right at the top of. The narration states that they all collected these sandbags, they collected these wheat bags and he stood at the top. Him and his representative Fatah bin Khaqan. When they stood at the top, they looked down at Imam Ali al-Hadi. And they said to Imam Ali al-Hadi, they said, look how grand our kingdom is. Where is your kingdom? You who stays at Khan al Sa'ali. Imam replied, look through my fingers and you'll see my kingdom. And when Mutawakkil looked through his uh, fingers, the narrations narrate that he recognized that you can build a palace so high and you can have the highest peak. I have Allah soldiers at the top to look after me. What you had there for, he was called Imam Hassan al-Askari because living in that area, it was an army base. And so the attribution is because of this. He had his brother Muhammad, him, Hussein, Ja'far and Ali. And from a young age, Imam al-Askari was already showing qualities like his forefathers. That one person narrates, I was walking one day, I saw these children, all of them are playing with toys except one young child who had shed a tear. He had shed a tear. So I came up to him, I said, young man, I see you've shed a tear. Are you sad that you don't have any toys? 
Shall I go and bring you toys? He looked at me and he said, Oh man, this world wasn't made for us to play with toys. He said, I looked at him. I said, I've never heard someone so young answer me like this. So I said to him, what do you mean? He said, oh man, have you not read the Quran? He said, I'm looking at this child and he's talking to me about the Quran. I said to him, what do you mean? Which verse in the Quran? Look at Al Muhammad. The Quran is part of their life, not something just in Shah Ramadan. Their followers today, Shah Ramadan, every Quran comes out. Al Muhammad, 365 days of the year, they have a relationship with the Quran. He said to him, which verse? He said, have you not read Surah 23 verse 115? He said, I don't even know what it says, tell me. He said, it says that do they think this world was created in vain and they will not return to us one day? He said, what do you mean by this? He said, when I look at my mother moving the sticks to make fire, I wonder about this fire, but I also wonder about the fire of the day of judgment. That am I going to be part of the fuel of that fire? He said, I asked the people, who is this child who's speaking to me like this? They said, Hassan al-Askari. From a young age, Imam al-Askari had this ability, and that's why the Abbasids had known that any moment now, al-Mahdi will be born. Is it al-Askari? Is it the one after him? The Abbasid Khalifa decided, al-Mu'taz, he decided that, you know what I'm going to do? Imam al-Jawad, we let him free to answer questions. Imam al-Hadi, we let him free to answer questions. This young man, it's better that we kill him. They made a decision. Their decision was that we're going to kill him. They said to him, but he's a young man. He said, I do not care. His father has now passed away. And now it's the time that we kill him. There's no need for these people in our territory. So he asked his companion, Ibn Sa'id, he said, Oh, Ibn Sa'id, I want you to do something for me. He said, what is it? He said, take the young man towards the palace of Ibn Ubair. On the way, kill the young man. And when you've killed him, come back and make an announcement that an accident unfortunately happened. And that's why the young man is not present with us anymore. They wrote letters to Imam al-Askari saying, Oh, Imam, we were at a meeting between Mu'taz the Khalifa and Ibn Sa'id. And he's planning to kill you on a journey. Remember, Imam was how old when his father died? Imam was around 22 years of age. So what happened was, he said, we're planning to, they're planning to kill you. Imam said, do not worry. This person in a few days time, he will be killed. And it's true. Subhanallah. Within three days, that Ibn Sa'id, the Turks had killed him. When the Turks killed Ibn Sa'id, the Khalifa decided, this Al-Askari, the best position for him is where? The best position for him is we place him in prison. And that's why you find Imam al-Askari, may Allah bless his soul, six years from the age of 22 until the age of 28, was placed in prison for the rest of his life. The Abbasids had two types of prison. One type of prison was a public prison. That's for thieves, for rapists, for people who've committed adultery, let's say these types of crimes we have today. The other prison was a private prison. You were under house arrest in your own house. They have guards standing outside and you're not allowed to go out. And do you know what they used to feed Imam al-Askari or not? Imam al-Askari, there are narrations which state for two years in a row, 730 days, used to live on two loaves of bread and cold water every day. I get surprised in this world, you know, I get surprised. Not just by those who attacked Al Muhammad, no. I get surprised when the followers of Al Muhammad today complain about what Allah has given them. You'll find a follower of Al Muhammad, Allah has given him a beautiful wife. Allah has given him beautiful children. Allah has given him a lovely house. One thing goes wrong, he says, why is Allah doing this to me? You're the one who had to live for two years on two loaves of bread and water? Or oh, Imam al-Askari had to live on that? They say Imam al-Askari entered healthy, by the end he was so frail. Frail! What do you do? Two loaves of bread, do you know what two loaves of bread is or no? Two loaves of bread and water. 
And there'd be times they'd have to go inside to check him. They'd see him on the ground. They'd think he is dying. They realize he's doing sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would see Imam al Askari. But you know, Imam al Askari teaches us something in life. Sometimes you may be in your house and that may be a prison. Sometimes you may be in a prison, but you make it a house. What do I mean? I mean that Imam al Askari sometimes teaches us. Whichever situation you find yourself in, make the best of it. I'm in prison. Just because I'm in prison doesn't mean I can't serve Allah. No. Let me serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the prison. And that's why, do you know what? If you look in Islamic history, it's as if history repeated itself. Which prophet in the Quran served Allah while he was in prison? Which prophet? Yusuf. Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, wasn't he in prison? Didn't he serve Allah in prison? Didn't he bring people towards Allah in prison? Some of the greatest personalities in history came to Allah in prison or wrote their best books in prison. If you look at Malcolm X, Malcolm X came to Allah in prison. If you look at one of our greatest books in Islamic law, the book by the name of al al Damashqiya. Al-Lum'a al-Damashqiya has to be studied before you come anywhere near being a leader of law. Al-Lum'a al-Damashqiya was written by Shaheed al-Awwal. And Shaheed al-Awwal wrote Al-Lum'a al-Damashqiya according to certain sources in one week in prison. It took him seven days and I tell you, go and read Al-Lum'a al-Damashqiya and ask yourself how can a man write this in seven days? It's a phenomenal text of law. You find Ibn Khaldun wrote Al Muqaddama in prison. In other words, some of the best works you can produce may be while you're in prison. Imam al Askari did not sit in prison and say, Now that I'm in prison, I should just pray and fast the whole day. No. Let me make the prison an avenue for spreading the word of Al Muhammad. How did he spread the word of Al Muhammad in prison? And I tell you, sometimes we are very negligent in our work with Muslims in prison. It's a shame. We have Muslims in prison, but none of our scholars are going to the prisons. Our scholars, alhamdulillah, their nikah and salat al mayat is very strong. But their outreach work can also improve. We need more scholars who visit prisons to see the Muslims in prison, to talk with them, to guide them. Imam al Askari taught us, I am in prison, but I'll bring people towards Ahlul Bayt from prison. And that's why, what do you find? You find, for example, Imam al Askari, the first way was that he thought to himself, My manners in prison will hopefully bring people towards Ahlul Bayt. How? Salih ibn Wasit narrates Salih ibn Wasit was a governor for the Abbasid Khalifa. He used to watch over Imam al Askari in prison. When he watched over Imam al Askari, he narrates, I sent two of the worst prison guards you will ever see in Samarra into the prison of Imam al Askari. He said, I told them, torture this man as much as you can. Torture this man as much as you can. The narrations mentioned that one day a group of people came to Saleh and they said to him, Saleh, you used to be very harsh, but you're not as harsh as you were before. He said, what do you mean? He said, these guards that you're sending into Hassan al-Askari are not doing anything. We want them to whip him, to kick him. They're not doing anything. He said, you go and ask the guards, don't ask me. They went to ask the guards. The guards were standing there. These guards who you don't want to wake up to looking their face in the morning. They looked at the guards. They said, why haven't you tortured Hassan al-Askari? said, why haven't you tortured Hassan al-Askari? And the narration states that when they looked at him, they said, how can we torture a man who in the daytime is fasting? And in the nighttime is praying. And whenever we look at him, we see his tongue move, moving in praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says that these two came towards Ahl al-Bayt because of Hassan al-Askari. They went in to do what to him? They went in to torture him. But they came out as followers of Al-Muhammad. There was a second person. 
who was a security guard for Imam al-Askari, he used to guard the prison. He has to keep a close eye on Imam al-Askari. Can you imagine an Imam, grandson of Rasulullah, grandson of Rasulullah, and you have guards watching over his every act? You found that Imam al-Askari saw this guard. The guard came up to me and said, Oh Hassan ibn Ali, here are some pomegranates. One of your Shia says that instead of just having two loaves and some water, he give him the pomegranates. And I used to know this person from before. Take them. So Imam al-Askari took the five pomegranates. He placed them by his side. This is tabligh. Tabligh isn't a person talking with long words. No, no, no. Tabligh sometimes is generosity. He's got the five pomegranates next to him. Imam al-Askari didn't eat them. He just kept them there. The guard kept on looking at the pomegranates. Imam looked at him. He said, you are all right. He said, yes, yes, I am. He said, why don't you take a pomegranate, oh God? Would you say that to a God who harasses you honestly? Honestly, a God who harasses you. Would you have this manners with him? He said, oh God, why don't you take this pomegranate? He said, no, no, keep it, keep it. He said, oh God, I've seen you looking at the pomegranate and maybe the day is a hot day. And because it's a hot day, maybe you're not getting fresh air. Take the pomegranate. The guard took the pomegranate. There were four pomegranates left. It was only a short time later that Imam al-Askari looked at the guard. He said, oh God, I notice that you're not eating the pomegranate. Why? The guard said, it's, don't worry, you don't need to ask. He said, no, tell me. He said, you know, I have young children at home. And I want to save the pomegranate so that my children can eat. You know what Imam al-Askari did? He said, take the other four pomegranates then. Subhanallah. Take the four pomegranates. The guard said, no. He said, no, no, please. He said, I can't bear to think that your children will not have food. Ya Imam, you are on two loaves of bread. And you're concerned about him. And remember, tonight is the night of the father of Imam al-Hujjah. This message goes out to Imam al-Hujjah tonight. That his father has two loaves of bread and the pomegranates, he says to the guard, take it. Then after that, when the head of the guards found out that Hassan al-Askar is like this, there was a Turkish head of guard. This Turkish head of guard, one of the names that he has given is Ali bin Yarmash. Another is Ali bin Utash. There is a difference of opinion on the names. This Turkish guard says, if you are not going to treat Hassan al-Askari in the way that he should be, by not whipping him while he's in his house, then I'm going to take him to my house. And I've got orders that even if I kill him, there isn't an issue. The guard took Imam al-Askari. They took him away out of his house, out of the prison. They took him to the Turkish man's house. The Turkish man, as soon as he walked into his house, his wife looked at him. She said, who is that you bought with you? He said, don't worry. She said, no, tell me. He said, Hassan bin Ali. She said, from whose lineage? He said, from Muhammad's lineage. She said, be careful. People like this, they are inheritors of knowledge. Do not hurt them. He said, who are you to tell me not to hurt them? I have wild animals in my garden. I'll leave the man with them. They have not eaten for a few days. Let them enjoy his flesh. You know, before Imam Zaman, people ask Imam Zaman, why did Allah raise him? Why? Because look at the way they're behaving with his father and with his grandfather. You think they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to keep a blessing like this with these people? They put Imam al-Askari in he, what he did. He put him in a cage with the wild animals. Absolutely no heart whatsoever. Do you know how low it is for a human to do such a thing? And he walked back to his house. His wife pleaded with him. He didn't listen. His wife pleaded with him to listen. She said to him, at least go back out. Now that they've killed him, go back out and have respect for yourself in burying his body, what remains of it. He narrates, I swear by God that I walked back out to the cage. I saw Hassan al-Askari prostrating with the animals all next to him. Imagine. He said, I could not believe that these animals had not eaten him. They had not eaten anything. And they were prostrating next to him. This same man, Ali bin Yarmash, who put Imam al-Askar in prison when his son fell ill. Do you know who he went to? Imam al-Askar. He went to Imam al-Askar in prison. 
He said, Hassan bin Ali, I need a favor. And I know I've been harsh towards you. And I know I've been giving you the worst of gods. I need one dua. He said, what, why? He said, my son is ill. And the doctors say he's going to die. And you're the only one who can read dua for him. I beg of you, read a dua. Imam al Askari said, no problem. Recite the following dua with me. He began reciting the dua. Began the reciting. He said, go home now. Your son will be okay. He says, I swear I went home and my son had recovered fully. Tell me, would you recite a dua for a man who tortures you? But Al Muhammad, their level of generosity, their level of morality is higher than all of this. And that's why, do you know, one day they tried to mock Imam al Askari? And do you know how they tried to mock him? One day the Khalifa's horse, the Khalifa bought a horse which was too wild. A wild horse. Do you know what the Khalifa said? This wild horse of mine, when I sit on it, it's not being tamed, it causes me trouble. Get Hassan al Askari out of prison. Let him sit on the horse so it throws him off. I don't know what these people are, honestly. Barbaric people or Muslims. And he says, but on the other hand, I know Hassan al Askari, if he truly is from the line of Rasulullah, that horse will never throw him off. You find that when Imam al Askari sat on that horse, that horse was tame. And he told the man, hey, come and take your horse back. The point was what? The point was that Imam al Askari, the first way he brought people towards Ahl al Bayt in prison was through his manners. They were giving him two loaves of bread and water. He was showing generosity back to them. That's number one. Number two, while in prison, there are two books which are ascribed to Imam al Askari. And I tell you today, I tell you, if you go to many of the followers of Ahl al Bayt, you say, What's the books of Imam al Askari? What's the books? They'll turn around to you and they'll say, <laughs> What do I know about books? Well, what are you talking about books? What's the books of Imam al-Askari? Are there any books of Imam al-Askari? Or did Imam al-Askari just live for a few years and die? Brothers and sisters, when we want to build a community, don't come and give me 100 plans for building a community when you don't know anything about the Imams of al-Muhammad. Because the Imams of al-Muhammad are what made us. Therefore, when we want to build communities, make sure you are people who are acquainted with the teachings of the Imams. Imam al Askari, while in prison, do you know there are many people today who don't know a single book of Imam al Askari? And they've been to Samara. I say to them, when you've been to Samara, why did you go to Samara? Why? Isn't it so you learn about Imam al Askari? What? Samara is just a holy place to go and sit next to a grave? Imam al Askari in Samara, two books he wrote. And these books should be in our houses. And it's a shame, forget them being in our houses, people don't even know about them. And I was in the auditorium, in the library in the auditorium, and I was looking under the section of the Imams, and I asked the elders, not the youth, no, the youth, mashallah, are doing fantastic. I asked the elders, take time out of your lives, your busy lives earning money, take time out. And go and sit in that library just half an hour a week, nothing more. Half an hour. Allah has given you more than enough risk now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be a community of educated readers. That library which is there, it's a shame hardly people go. There's a book there in the library translated by Ansariya and it's available. The tafsir of the Quran of Imam al Askari alayhi salam. Now this tafsir of the Quran, whether it's actually written by the Imam or ascribed to him from students who had come from Qom, there's a debate about Ibn al-Ghada'iri and his opinion on this work, a debate which has semantics and discussions which I can discuss on another occasion. But the tafsir of Imam al-Askari, even Shaykh al-Saduq relies on it in the Faqih. You find that this tafsir of Imam al-Askari, while in prison, and while on the house arrest, people would come and ask verses of the Quran from Imam al Askari. And Imam al Askari would answer it in his tafsir. And that tafsir is with us until today. You ask people, have you read the tafsir of your 11th Imam or no? Another of his great works is a fiqh work, Al Muqni'ah. This work until today is available with us today. It is there, it's a book of all jurisprudential questions where Imam al-Askari writes letters answering his Shia on different aspects of fiqh. Today when people say, how do these maraja answer questions? The maraja answer questions by using the book of Imam al-Askari and Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam. 
These two books, Imam al Askar, you think he wrote them under a time where he's sitting under the sun in a nice house? He wrote them while he was in prison. While in prison, Imam al Askar would write them. Further than this, do you know what Imam al Askar would also do while in prison? He tell the people, what is happening outside of prison? Come and tell me. Do not keep me unaware so I can help you guide. I can help you answer the questions. One day, a person came to him. He said, oh Imam, do you know Ishaq al-Kindi? He said, yes. He said to him, Ishaq al-Kindi has written a book called The Contradictions in the Quran. There are some verses in the Quran which sound contradictory. And unless you have strong knowledge of the Quran, which we need in this generation, then do not be surprised if you will be bamboozled by some of the questions about contradictions in the Quran. Someone says, what do you mean? For example, in one verse in the Quran, Ishaq al-Kindi said there's a contradiction. In one verse of the Quran, God says that marry one, two, three, or four women. In another verse in the Quran, God says you can never treat them justly. So stick to one. So some people ask, how is it in one verse God says marry four, and another God says you can't treat them justly? And this on the internet is a major question. On the internet today, many say the Quran has contradictions. In the time of Imam al-Askari, Ishaq al-Kindi wrote a book, The Contradictions of the Quran. He says if the Quran is the book of God, then it wouldn't have contradictions. In one verse of the Quran, it says marry one, two, three or four women. In another verse of the Quran, it says what? You will never be able to treat them justly. So you find, what's the interpretation of this? The interpretation is that you will marry one, two, three and four. You can treat them justly in economics, the way you treat them financially. And you can treat them justly with your time. But you can never treat them justly with love. I can't say I love wife number one 33% and wife number two 27.8%, can I? So there's no contradiction. The first one refers to justice in monetary and in time. The second one is about love. Ishaq al-Kindi wrote this book called Contradictions in the Quran. The companions of Imam al-Askari came to him when he was in prison. They said, Imam, Ishaq has written this book. He said, have any of you been able to refute it? They said, no. He said, the refutation is easy. It doesn't need lots of semantics. They said to him, what's the refutation? He said, go up to Ishaq and say to him, oh, Ishaq, is there a possibility the author of a book intends something different from the interpreter? It's a very, very philosophical line. Is there a possibility that the author of a book intends something different from the interpreter? Ishaq said, yes, there is. So the companion said to him, so Ishaq, what you say about a contradiction, could Allah have meant something else? Or is your interpretation the only interpretation possible? He said, no, Allah could have meant something else. He said, so oh Ishaq, why don't you then say that maybe my conclusions are not correct and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended something else with this? Ishaq said to them, where did you get this answer from? They said to him, what do you mean? He said, no, no, tell me, where did you get the answer from? The person said, oh, just from my own thoughts. He said, none of you can think like this. Where did you get it from? He said, I got it from Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam. He said, only a man from the line of Rasul Allah can think like this. He said, it is very true. He took the paper, that book, and he ripped it. He ripped all the pages. He said, that one interpretation is right. Maybe I'm saying there's contradictions, but maybe the author, Allah, the author of the Quran, intended something else. Then on another occasion, Imam had wanted to be kept informed what's happening. Mu'tamad Abbas al-Khalifa was ma uh, facing major trouble. Why? Samarra, there was a major drought in Samarra. No rain. No rain. So what happened was, Mu'tamad said to the whole of Samarra, Oh people of Samarra, come out and pray that Allah sends down rain for three days. The whole of Samarra came out to pray, Ya Allah, send down rain. Ya Allah, send down rain. There was no rain coming down. All of a sudden, a Christian monk came. The Christian monk, when he came, he said, Oh Allah, 
please send down rain. Suddenly rain came down. Martem, it's like, what's going on? Every Muslim prays to Allah and no rain comes down. And a Christian monk prays to Allah and that much rain comes down. And the Muslims started saying, maybe Christianity is the right religion. Because you are a Khalifa, you pray to Allah, you say you are Khalifa to Allah, aren't you? Why is it you are Khalifa, you're praying to Allah for rain, no rain. A Christian monk comes, he prays to Allah, so much rain comes down. Maybe we should follow Christianity. Muhammad went crazy. Where is Hassan Askari? They said to him, what do you mean where? You put him in prison. He said, get him out of prison. Imam al-Askari came. Muhammad said, I need a big favor. Imam al-Askari doesn't say to him, you know what, you put me in prison, I don't want to help you. Imams of Ahl al-Bayt, Islam is always bigger than everything for them. From their grandfather Ali ibn Abi Talib until Imam al-Askari, Islam is bigger for them. Imam al-Askari looked at him, he said, what help do you want? He said a few days ago, there was a, a drought, no rain was coming down. The people relied on me to pray. I relied on them to pray. Nothing came. Then a Christian prayed. Everything came. Imam said, very well. You will find that there's a period of a drought continuing, isn't there? There's no more rain coming down. He said, yes. He said, tell the Christian again to come out and pray. And I'm going to come and tell all the people to come as well. Mu'tamid said, very well. The hot day came. Mu'tamid said, where's the Christian monk? Tell him to come. The Christian monk came. The people all came. Imam al-Askari looked at Mu'tamid. He said, as soon as I tell you to grab his hands and open them, grab his hands and open them. So Mu'tamid looked at the Christian monk. He said, Christian monk, pray again to Allah. So rain comes down. Christian monk came. He raised his hands. Mu'tamid opened them. Imam said, now tell me what's in his hands. As soon as he removed that, what was in his hands, Imam said, do you see this? Mu'tamid said, yes. He said, do you know what it is? He said, no. He said, it's a bone from one of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This Christian monk and his people had dug the grave of a prophet and taken a bone out. And when they took the bone out, then they prayed to Allah, Ya Allah, in the name of the bone of this prophet, let rain come down. And the people were amazed. And then Mu'tamad said, thank you. And do you know what the people turned around and said? This Hassan al-Askari, where does he live? We want to come and follow him. Is he in charge of a university? Is he in charge of a school? Is he in charge of a library? Where is his palace so we come and visit him? And Mu'tamid was embarrassed to say to them, I have put him under house arrest. And the people looked at him and they said, how dare you put a man like him under house arrest? Mu'tamid said, but no, from today, Hassan al-Askari is released and there is no more house arrest. Literally, he released him for that one year. In that one year, the narrations say that in that one year he released him, then he brought him back into the prison again. I tell you, there was no rest for Imam al-Askari. No rest whatsoever. You found that Imam al-Askari would try his hardest to give out information to his followers. He would try his hardest to tell his followers about the beliefs of the religion. And that's why one of the most famous hadiths we have from Imam al-Askari was when he was telling his Shia, what are the signs of a Shia? What are the signs of a believer? Imam al-Askari knew that in a short time, his son Imam al-Hujjah would leave from the eyesight of the people. So Imam al-Askari gave us that there are five signs of a Shia. Please listen to this hadith, I beg all of you. There are five signs of a Shia, a follower of Al-Muhammad. The first is that he prostrates on dust and preferably the dust of the Karbala of Abi Abdullah. Someone says, why do we prostrate on dust? Why don't we prostrate just on carpet? We in the school of Ahlul Bayt have clear evidence that Rasulullah has a hadith where he says, number one, Indama ju'ilat li al ard masjidan wa tahura. The earth has been made a place which is pure and for prostration. And that Rasulullah in his time, there were no carpets. Rasulullah in the books of hadith of our books and other schools, Rasulullah when he was in sujood, when he would stand up from sujood, when he would sit up from sujood, people would look at his forehead, there would be the marks of mud. 
the marks of clay. Rasulullah therefore did not used to pray on a prayer mat. He used to pray on earth because he said the earth has been made pure and been made a place of prostration for me. The carpets or the prayer mats came into the Prophet's mosque 300 years after he died. Number one. So people say, does that mean that we should only prostrate on the dust of Karbala? No. Any dust, as long as this is natural and not something which can be eaten or can be worn, anything which is natural can be prostrated. Number one. Number two, our Shia pray 51 rak'ahs of prayers a day. At the moment, we're struggling with 17. How many? 17. If you add Salat al layl how many do we reach? 28, let's say. So where's the other 23 coming from, O oh, Imam al-Askari? The Sunnah prayers for Fajr, say the Sunnah prayers for Dhuhr and Asr, which are only 16, by the way, for Maghrib and for Isha. Add all of these together, Imam al-Askari says, the second sign of our followers is 51 rak'ah of prayer a day. How many? 51, inshallah. The third sign, they wear a ring on their right hand. If you look at many of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, when they go to Ziyara, they will buy either a Durr al-Najaf, or they'll buy Fayruz, or they'll buy Aqiq Yamani, or they'll buy a ruby or an emerald. All of these we have hadith from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt as to their importance. Now look at your right hand and ask yourself, do you have one or no? They protect you from envy of the people. They increase your rizq. They prevent sudden attack from affecting your family. Wear them. Do not let go of your right of the ring on the right hand. Number four, you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim loudly before any act. Sometimes we have reached the stage we pray, we say Bismillah, but when we eat, we've forgotten Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When we go to work, we've forgotten Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When we enter our houses, we've forgotten Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We've forgotten in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. And the fifth Imam al-Askari says, the fifth sign is Ziyarat al-Arba'een of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. That Imam al-Askari says that never, ever neglect the Ziyarah of the Arba'een of Imam al-Hussein. There are a couple of the Ziyarahs of the Arba'een, one of them from Jabir bin Abdullah. Imam al-Askari says the fifth sign of our followers is they never neglect Ziyarat al-Arba'een of Imam Hussein. And that's why Imam al-Askari at the age of 28, Imam al-Askari of his great companions, he had Fadl bin Shadan and he had Abu al-Adyan. Imam al-Askari at the age of 28, Imam al-Askari, the poison began to surround his body. Al-Mu'tamad had noticed this man, I put him out of prison, the people love him. I put him back in prison, the people become followers of Ahlul Bayt because of him. It's better that I poison him. May Allah give patience to the Imam of our time when he remembers his father, Imam al-Askari And the narration say that Imam al-Askari said to his companion, O oh, Abu al-Adyan, I'm giving you some letters to go to Madain. You know where Salman is buried in Madain? He said, I'm giving you some letters. Go to Madain. I want you to go there, deliver these letters. You will return in 15 days. When you return to Samarra, you will hear the people saying, Al-Askari has died. I want you to go to, Sa to Madain and there will be letters. When you return, the people will be saying Al-Askari has died. You will see the one who will succeed me from Al-Muhammad, Al-Mahdi. He said, how will I know him? He said, you'll know him because number one, he will lead my prayers. Number two, he'll ask you for the letters. Number three, he'll know what's in the yellow bag. Abu al-Adyan says, I left. I went to Madain to meet Ahmed ibn al-Hasan. I went there. I had all of these letters. What are the letters? Imam al-Askar used to stay up till the middle of the night answering the questions of his Shia. He can't see them. 
So he writes his answers and they send them back as letters. He went to Ahmed ibn Hassan. Ahmed ibn Hassan welcomed him. They stayed there for a few days. Abu al-Adyan says, all I was thinking about was Imam al-Askari. I was thinking about my Imam. What's going to happen to him? When I returned back to Samarra, I said to him, Oh Abu al-Adyan, if you saw what's happened to his shrine only recently, you'll know that this Imam al-Askari until today is oppressed by his followers and his enemies. You found Abu al-Adyan says, I left Ahmed ibn Hassan. I came back to Samarra. When I entered Samarra, I saw people coming out crying and crying. I said to them, what's wrong? They said to me, Hassan al-Askari has died. He said, I went to the house of Imam al-Askari and I saw his brother Ja'far standing there about to lead Salat al-Mayyit, the prayers of the one who is deceased. When I saw Ja'far, Ja'far was saying, I am now the Imam of the Shia. I am the Imam of the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. I thought, Ja'far, Ja'far, the person who is a liar, Ja'far, the person who we have no respect for. So he says, as Ja'far was about to begin with his Salah, a young five-year-old walked up to him. He said to him, oh Ja'far, move. I have a greater right to lead the Salah than you do. Ja'far was amazed. Who is this young man who has come? Who we will discuss tomorrow? Ja'far returned back. The young man led the Salah. Then after the young man finished the Salah, he turned around and he came and he said to Abu al-Adyan, where are the letters? Abu al-Adyan knew that this is also a sign. Then the narration states a group of people had come from Qum. They had some homes. They had placed it in a bag. They came. They said, who is the rightful successor of Hassan al-Askari? The people looked and they said, it is Ja'far. Ja'far said, it is me. The people of Qum said, then tell us if you are his rightful successor, what's in the bag? He said, what do you think? I have knowledge of the unseen. Then someone came and said, there is 1,010 dinar in the bag. They said, you are right. Who told you? He said, my Imam, al hujjah ibn al-Hasan al-Mahdi, Allah farajah al-Sharif. As soon as the, they heard that, they said, where is he? They turned around, Mu'tamad heard. He said, where is the young boy? The Imam had been taken away. And you found that difficult period for the followers of Al Muhammad, which inshallah we will continue to discuss tomorrow as to the biography of Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Imam al Askari alayhi salam, to allow us to visit his shrine in the land of Samarra. Ya Allah, allow for the rebuilding of that holy shrine and the shrine of the mother of our Imam and the sister of our Imam. Ya Allah, allow us to receive his intercession in this world and the hereafter. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our brothers, especially the ill ones in our community and those around the Islamic world with the following dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amma yujibu al-Muftar idha da'a wa yakshub al-Su'a. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُفْطَرِ إِذَا دَعَا وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءِ أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُفْطَرِ إِذَا دَعَا وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءِ I beg you raise your hands just with a bit more fervor. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُفْطَرِ إِذَا دَعَا وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءِ أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُفْطَرِ إِذَا دَعَا وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءِ We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the Surah Al-Fatiha but before it, the loudest of your salawat. Allah.